Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Michael Branvold, and as always, I'm joined by Jay Gilbert. How you doing, Jay? Great, Michael. So, um, before we get into this week's very fun episode, um, yeah. as always, lots of love and thank yous and gratitudes to uh, HypeBot, Bruce, everybody at HypeBot for everything you do to support the show and promote the show. And, of course, Bands in Town, everything you do to, to support us as well. It is appreciate greatly it. appreciated. Um, so, Jay, we got a special guest this week. Yeah, we do. We have Andrea Young. She's the partner and chief playlisting officer from DPG, which stands for Digital Promotions Group. And they do it all. You know, they're part label, label services, marketing, promotion, and, uh, you know, Andrea has been around a while and she has some really good insights on this new music business. And, and we really focus on the playlisting part of the service. How does that yeah. work? How do they do it? Um, and, and actually at the end, by the end of the, the episode, lots of great takeaway tips. If you're an artist who is considering hiring a playlist promoter, um, some good advice that you should yeah. pay attention to here. So... Let it roll. Today we have partner and chief playlisting officer from Digital Promotions Group, formerly Coral Young. Um, it's part label, part label services, part marketing, part promotion. It's a, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of things. It's Andrea. a lot of parts. Am I pronouncing that right? Is it Andrea or? It's Andrea. Andrea. But I don't anything, but it's Andrea. All right, Andrea Young. Uh, welcome yeah. and thanks for yeah. joining us. Hi guys, happy hey. to be here. Great. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So you come from a background of publicity, right? Marketing, advertising, publicity, yes. So tell us a little bit about your journey. How did, what, how did you get through all of those different disciplines? So I did work for um, a label distributor many long time ago, and I also uh, helped computerize the retail music business when there was such a thing, right? I've been around a while. Um, I started when I was a baby. And, um, and so I, I did that, and then I also ran a public radio station. So everything is sort of driven by my love of curation and, 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 uh, and whatever format to deliver music. And the way I got here is that I've had a radio show on Aspen Public Radio for many, many years where I introduce a lot of new artists and those artists started to ask me to help them. And, you know, what can I do? How can I get my music out there? You like my music. Will somebody else like my music kind of thing? And from there, I, I started my company to help artists deliver their music and understand what could help them. And um, I partnered with um, Nadine Jeleno. Did you guys know Nadine? No. Okay. So she ran an indie marketing company called Musebox. And Eric and I partnered with her. It was sort of a tragic story where she she uh, passed away from cancer. And Eric and I really, Eric Coral and I, really just started to take over the things that she had built and expand on what I had started um, at Aspen Beat, which is my radio show. So that was three years ago. And my passion is, again, curation. That's my passion, my personal passion. So I really was paying attention to that space. And I just loved this idea of it being a bit more democratic on how artists could possibly make revenue off their streams or make revenue off, off uh, getting their music heard worldwide, um, maybe without even touring or doing other things, which I know are very important. But I just love this idea. And um, that's how I got into this. It's been about three years. We worked with about 150 artists. It's this messy, vibrant space right now, right? You guys know it. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the, the stream, yeah. not, not just the whole music industry itself, but the streaming chunk of it changes literally daily. I mean, it's no joke. We can all wake up every day and there's a new a new player is coming out a new feature has been announced a new merger is happening um you know new yeah we like to joke that it's changed while we've been on this yeah call. It, 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 <laughs> you know it, we, 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 you know we we, we all kind of laugh because i mean we're all in this space but it's sort of like yeah anybody who claims they've been doing this stuff playlist streaming for a decade 
it hasn't even been around a decade, people. You know, it, oh, it, yeah. it, it, oh. it's such an infant part of the business right now. But, so, you know, it's grown to be such a critical part and such a fast-changing part. Right? Yeah, and it's so misunderstood, too, right? I mean, there's so many different parts of it, and nobody, I agree with you. It's really messy. Nobody knows what's going on, really. And we, I'm the last person to say I know what's going on. I'm trying to be in the flow of what's going on to understand so I can pass it along to people that I work with, artists and their teams that we work with, to help them understand. And I'm, I mean, I'm, it's a lot of education. It, that's well, like right. that, that's what, that's what right? Jay, and, Jay and I have said over and over is, if nothing else educate yourself to what's going on here right. you know right. before you cry that you're making only pennies off of your streaming maybe go read your contract with your label or whoever is in control of your copyrights and see what that says because as we all know there's plenty of money that's coming out of streaming services is it trickling all the way down to the artist and what's in, in between there is that that's the education that's got to happen. I totally agree. And both on the label side and also for artists who decide to do it themselves. Do you know, yeah. there's so many places to pay attention to, right? So a label might have all of that set because they have machines of, they have systems and structures in place, but an independent artist may not have a personal relationship with the uh, DSPs or may not know tour managers or whatever they need to help their artists. So artists, those independent artists and there's their teams, that's part of what I love is that is just trying to help them as well, help uh, to understand what so, they need. To so do. did yeah. you build your, your playlist? Cause we're just going to focus on the playlisting streaming part of your business. Okay. Um, did you build that up from scratch then? I did. So pretty much what we did, um, and again, it's about three years ago, 2000, I think October 2016, is we just started to do some research to figure out, um, we, we knew we couldn't get to Spotify and ask them to, to uh, feature our artists unless we had personal relationships with Spotify, and that doesn't go very far, right? You can't help thousands of artists with just a personal relationship with someone. So we were looking for ways to get artists music heard to, to help them get their streams up to help them and, and in, in fact that's how we started we were all about oh no you got to get your screen streams up well we all know that that's not really what it's about anymore right it's more about fan engagement it's more right. about getting you know but but if you're not doing anything and i heard your um podcast with mike warner the other day forty thousand tracks a day being released on the platform that's right if you're not doing anything, then to, to help get the word out, then you're 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 probably not going to have a chance of getting any your music heard. So we started out looking for ways to get streams up, and um, we we um, we reach out to the independent playlister community because because we don't really the, the the DSPs all tell you you know there's hey no there's not a chance that you can all you know contact us and get your music. Yeah, they'll, 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 they'll basically, <laughs> listen, they'll just say, go to your Spotify for Artists page and submit fill your track, fill, fill out the submission form, which people, that is a legit form. That's a legit submission. Right. So don't, 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 don't take that as a brush off that just throw, go, automatically goes into a garbage somewhere. That is legitimate and you should be doing that. <laughs> That's oh, right. I couldn't. Yes, a hundred percent. Thank you for saying that. That's not to delegitimize that. That's that's that. But how many artists get on those editorial playlists that they're craving that are the brass ring, right? right. Out of forty thousand tracks a day, how many get on those editorial playlists? Yeah, Maybe not very many. Right. Maybe it'll be more and more. So we've been looking for other ways to help artists understand what they can be doing, actually, to increase fan engagement now, which. Right leads to the algorithm is paying more attention, right? Which degree that the algorithms pay more attention? I the think there are ways that on. you can optimize um, your um, online presence to make uh, the most out of algorithms. And it's not rocket science. I mean, there are certain obvious things um, that you can do and things that you should avoid doing. I think that it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, I. I think what you're describing that you've built, it reminds me a little bit of what uh, Jay Frank, um, rest his soul, 
no. um, what, what he built. And he was probably the first in the space, you know, with Dixon and, you know, to understand that, especially back then, because this is, you know, quite a long time ago in the streaming world, where he couldn't get the attention that he wanted with the DSPs, uh, particularly Spotify. So he built a network of user curators. And that network got large because he was one of the first in the space. And back then, some of these uh, user-curated playlists had better real estate on the DSPs. And he could actually affect change because no matter what the genre was, he had curators that he could send the music to. And if they liked it, they would add it. It would be in those top spots. It would generate those spins, which comes full circle around to what you were talking about. If these user-curator playlists are generating spins then that algorithm kind of sees that and then it might be tested in other playlists is that kind of what you're doing is building a, a network of user curators by genre by mood by whatever that you can service your clients to yeah that's a big part of what i do absolutely i think that's a great uh description of what we do um you know we call it salting the pot do you know, it's like, yeah. and, and just depending on where you are, because every artist is different, right? No two campaigns are the same. Right. And um, do you have anything going on as an artist? Are you touring? You know, it's all those things that you talk about in your uh, playlisting is not a marketing plan. Totally on board with that. Um, do you well, have, you know, and, 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 and <laughs> it even goes back to the very basic, which comes out of the world, the publicity world. When you sat down with a publicist, what's your story? What's, yeah, your what's, the narrative? what's your story? What's your story? I got a new track. That's not a story. Sorry to tell you, having a new track mm -hmm. is not the story. What's the story of the track? Why yeah. is that playlister going? Because even these third-party playlisters are getting slammed with submissions. So how do you how do you f get yourself above the noise of everybody else? And I think we all know from experience, it's what. What connects to that playlister? What's the story that makes them go, oh, wow. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, I've got to listen to this after hearing what they went through to do this. You know, something that tugs at the heartstrings is going to get the attention over something that is just, here you go. Listen. Yeah, it, you've got to have that narrative. And, and, you know, Spotify even requires that now in the submission form. Early on, it wasn't a part of it. But now you have to, like, what is the narrative? Why should anybody care? And, you know, we, we bring up this example all the time, um, Cheap Tricks' first album. You know, you pull that sleeve out, and there's one side of that inner sleeve is a story about Cheap Trick. And most of it is not true. <laughs> it's just their shot. And this was in 1977, right? <laughs> it was their shot at creating a narrative. And guess what? It worked because Hit Parader, Cream, you know, all these uh, trouser press, all these different publications picked that up and grabbed interviews with them. And then they could kind of laugh it off and, you know, build from it. But there's always something compelling about that narrative. And, and Andrea, do, do you find that when you're working with clients that that's one of the first things that you sit down with them and, and try to pull out of them is like, what's, what's special about this? What is that narrative? Oh, t totally. I think that's part of our job is to help them to understand what, what parts, what the narrative should be about. Um, and, and really it's about their cred, right? Because our job or the job of, of the disc of the submission in Spotify for artists, for example, that you're talking about that direct submission, that job is to get somebody to click on that link and listen to that track, right? That, yep. That's what you're looking to do. You need to get somebody to click and listen. What happens after that? That's not, in our control, no. that's the music, right? Yeah. That's the music and where it fits in the marketplace and what the curator is looking for and, and all that kind of stuff. But you, you, you've got to find a way to give them something, as you're both saying. And, yes, I think that's really one of the most important parts. Besides everything else that is all about the best practices of of do you have your bio? Do you have your social links? Do you have your photos? You know, I'm a, you know, I said in the beginning, curation is, is really what I love. And so there's nothing more frustrating for me as a fan than to find an artist, find a track, 
and then not be able to find out anything about the artist, not be able to find it on Spotify, not be able to find out where the artist is, because that's my journey is, is wanting more from that artist. So we, yes. So yes, all of that. And very important. So do you work with um, music blogs? Yes, we do. Because I, I think it's one of the underserved and people don't talk about it too much because it's, it requires a little bit of work, but uh, I found that not only do I firmly believe that they're tastemakers and that the digital service providers are watching what they're doing um, because I've seen things happen that could only happen that way, but yeah, it takes a little bit more work. You can't just shotgun um, you know, a spray and pray kind of uh, campaign out to these folks. It has to be more of a personal um, connection there, right? So what's, how do you approach uh, music blogs? So we have a publicist on staff who separately approaches the music blogs, although I've been saying for years that I really hope that the, the whole ecosystem comes together blogs and playlists because i think they should blogs should have playlists well playlists i was, I was yeah i was gonna say <laughs> they, they they really are because that's that's what people don't realize your favorite blog might have a playlist they just may not have their act together in promoting that playlist but right. they probably have a playlist or the writer has a personal playlist but it's right. it, it's definitely starting to merge into a a, a I don't, I don't want to say murky, but it's, all right, is it a playlist? Is it a blog? Well, it's both. That's yeah. right. I agree with that. Um, so we go out to them separately now because, as you stated, there's there's a whole – publicity and press relationships are much more mature than playlisting relationships, right? Like I'll sometimes have an artist team come to me and say, well, you know, we're having a, 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 a showcase uh, in Nashville. So would you invite all the playlisters? And Nashville, Nashville might not be a, a, a great example, but will you invite all the playlisters in Nashville to that showcase? Well, playlisters aren't as geographically located, right? So whereas you have press that's geographically located, uh, playlisters are sort of worldwide. They don't always tell us where they're from. So so it's, it's, it's different uh, yeah. avenues of reaching out, but I think it's really important, especially right now. I've seen... I've seen it become more important, I think, recently. I, I, th I think artists also need to realize that that a lot of the playlists, third-party playlists that we're talking about here, not, not mm -hmm. the DSP curated ones, third-party right. playlisters maybe never started this with any intention of anything. It's not like they sat down and said, I'm going to write a blog and I'm going to start reviewing music and I'm going to start reviewing shows. They just were pulling together their fun songs that they liked. Their friends jumped on board. It started rolling. And it's never become, quote, a business for the playlister. It's just something they do. So you have to respect the fact that when you're reaching out to that third-party playlister, it might just be some average person who, you know, yeah, I'll get to it. It's not my, it's not my gig running a playlist. I'll get to it in the next two weeks. Because that's all the time I commit to it. I think that's really true. I mean, within the third-party user playlist or universe, I mean, you've got brands yep. who have playlists. Those are considered third-party playlists, right? Those aren't Spotify company sure. playlists. Um, and you've got uh, professional playlisters, they may do this for a, or try to do this as a living, right? This is what they do. They put out every month, they put out a playlist and they put it out all over the platforms and they have uh, uh, shows and showcases of the artists that they love. But a majority of the playlists that we go out to are small, these independent playlisters and their playlists, and they're messy, as you just noted. They, they, it might not be a business for them. I mean, how are playlisters making a living? Are they? You know, well, the yeah, I mean, that. well, you know, that brings up an interesting sidebar, which I think is worth making sure everyone understands. Oh. If, if you know, if that playlister is saying, give me 50 bucks to get on don't. my playlist, don't do that because never, ne ne you know, first of all, the playlist itself could be gone tomorrow when Spotify finds out somebody's charging. But you as an artist who paid could also have your account completely suspended. Yeah. Forever. I've seen it happen, yeah. I've seen it happen so for so few streams that were purchased like that. Um, 
I, I know it's hard because we, uh, you know, uh, I think as an artist, every artist thinks that they're releasing great music and the world should listen to it. Right. And I get it. I totally sure. get it. And that everyone should love it. And I get that too. So I think it's very frustrating for artists to see how long it can take. And I'd love to hear what you say about that as far as developing you're following on the streaming platforms and yeah. touring and whatever. It's not, you know, so we offer campaigns um, and they might be short campaigns, but that's really just to help artists get started. It's really a long tail effort. I It is. It's, a, it's, it's artist development. And, and look, I get it. You want your music out. You want it out now. You want as many ears to hear it as possible. And that's, that's all legit. Um, I think the part that I have to remind folks pretty much every week with clients is the artists, managers, labels, distribution companies, whoever it is, they'll come in and say, here's what we need. We need, we need to be on these playlists. And that's where I say time out. And that's where the, a playlist is not a marketing plan comes in. It's like, do, first of all, are you planning in advance? You know, are you just dropping music in the marketplace and hoping, you know, that something good happens? Um, yeah, playlists are interesting and they're good and we all want our artists to be featured in them. But, you know, at our panel at Music Biz, you know, we had, you know, the head of Warner Brothers Records talking about how few of his spins were actually coming from curated playlists. Yeah, that, that was interesting. It's, it's really good. And then it's also, you know, you have to look at like, well, what position are you in in that playlist? I, I was looking at this artist yesterday and they had done a couple of things that all I think the three of us would advise them not to do. One is buying followers and buying uh, spins. And first of all, anybody that's legit in the touring world, sync world, label world, they'll be able to look at the data and see these aren't these aren't real. You know, you went from this to this, and you, you can see that you have this many followers but very few listeners, and and all of that stuff. But it was interesting looking at all of these smaller playlists that they got on and some of them even in the title hinted at this is how you pay to get into this playlist um do you find when you're dealing with clients that they they want to run before they walk they don't want to do the hard work to put together an actual plan and and execute that plan they just want these playlists and they want they just want the results 30 days from now absolutely in fact it's really tough to keep that at a minimum because it as you just said it muddies the waters for us so we don't know if the market's really responding or not do you know we're, we're out there to see what the market is going to say about a track and some tracks the market really responds positively authentically right yeah. and that's that can sometimes happen immediately but for most tracks it's just this long tail effort of releasing a track one track after another possibly to get more exposure for the band while they're touring and building their fan guys that's the fan base so uh, it's really tough to convince artists not to go that what they see as a route to make themselves look really good because the venues yeah. and everyone are telling them that's what's most important well i'm looking at your streams you don't have any streams, <laughs> right right, right. So they don't want to spend years developing. They want it, as you said, in 30 days. Give right. me the and I hear these managers that equate streaming with radio. So they think that, well, with radio, I hire a radio promotion firm, and I can put enough money, depending on the format, and I can, I can drive change with money. And you really can't do that you know, on the streaming side. It's... It's it's a lot more dangerous, but it's also so much easier to find out what's real and what's not. But what about what Spotify also announced, I think, in the past couple of days about the the targeted uh, ads? Yeah. That oh, the tar- ver- that, that was very interesting, right? especially when it was revealed. So it, 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 the, the, what we're discussing here is I think maybe a month ago it came out that Spotify was going to allow targeted advertising within the streams. And initially, it was going to be available to labels, majors, and stuff like that. Right. And and what just came out in the past few days, and I'm sure if you just hit HypeBot, you can do a search. Yeah, it's on this, HypeBot. I'm looking at um, it. Was the cost of what that was going to be. And and the, the headline I remember was, the cost makes this pretty much prohibitive to anybody. Yeah, it says indie labels can't afford to use it. If an indie label can't afford to use it, 
an independent artist sure isn't going to be able to afford to use it. And I think the example they sh they mentioned was Spotify is recommending a budget of five thousand dollars. Right. Right. And Listen, then they. I'm Go ahead, Michael. I was going to say, and then they equated with roughly how many streams you should be getting out of that, and the math was calculated. It's like, all right, you're paying five thousand dollars for this x amount of streams, and you're only going to make nine bucks in the end out of this. Yeah. So See, I have a different. I have a different opinion, and I, I respect that. But I had this conversation with an artist manager yesterday, and I actually like this program. And for a couple of reasons. One is that if you do believe in your track and you have the funds to do this, you, they they have to play the whole song, which is great, number one. Number two, they know it's a sponsored song. Number three, they're not going to put an EDM song in front of a country playlist. It's all going to have to fit and make sense. And they're not the first to do this. Deezer had tested this you know, a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, so I think that we're going to get to a place where these sponsored songs, you know, and again, this is mostly on the free version. It will be on the paid version, but you can turn it off on the paid version. But I think they have, what is it? 120, 130 million people on the free version that it's kind of like the marquee uh, uh, ad that you place at Spotify. Um, you'll be able to pay and have these things placed and reach an audience and yeah it's, it is expensive and i wish it wasn't but if it wasn't as expensive everybody on the planet would do it and there wouldn't be any room i mean i think they have to kind of set a stake in the ground um at serious players who have the funding to get behind it to do it i mean i would love to have some of my indie artists who don't have a lot of money in that program and I think there's two things that have to happen here. One is I, I love this program and I, I, I think that it could really help to bring great music to people's ears. It's kind of like if you watch the Now That's What I Call Music uh, CDs, mm -hmm. um, they always have a place on there called What's Next, which is like four or five, six tracks of developing artists. So you're on there with Drake and the Chainsmokers and Katy Perry and whoever, but then there's that that other section down there now of course i believe that's an editorial decision i would rather that the spotify thing be an editorial decision and and i don't like the idea of necessarily right. getting into paying for all of this stuff but I, I like having a tool that i can use to get something that i really believe in in front of people well I, you know and i i, I want to add real quick i do think what they've launched here is very cool, but as we started this whole show off with, it it's just launched. It is just launched. The you yeah, know it it, it, it you know um, go try and remember back to when Facebook first launched targeted advertising. Right, right. You know it's evolved right. in the Facebook world so much since then. Continues and I to. and I I can pretty right. much guarantee you the Spotify platform is going to evolve the same way the fact 100%. that they're they are giving you that they acknowledge that an opportunity needs to be made to get allow you to get in front of a targeted audience is right. really important now how that's going to evolve we just know it will we don't know how but you know you can pretty much bet that if they do this and they prove that revenue can be made from this that the other DSPs are going to jump on board and start doing the same thing. And, you know, at the end of the day, as a marketing person, I think that's great. I know my toolbox has the potential to target right. people all over if the budget is there. Yeah. yeah, we have two artists right now who are sort of playing with this idea of um, advertising to get people who might be interested in listening to their music on the social media platforms, and they'll probably work do the Spotify thing as well. And it's very, it, uh, it's, as you said, it's, it's all new, and I'll be really interested to see. These are artists without any following. These are not established artists. These are artists who have resources, their teams have resources, and they're just going to go out with someone no one's ever heard of before themselves and and see what, what they can get going with advertising and, and marketing campaigns, just like any brand would do in the world, right? 
only now in the world of music. Yeah. So um, I'll be very interested as well to see what happens. I'm sort of what, what you said, Michael, you know, I'm, I'm open to anything that works, right? Yeah. If, but, but, but not only for the top tier. Right. Do you know that that's my question is where where's that group of uh, 150,000 artists as um, uh, Willard Odritz from Cobalt said, you know, right now, 5,000 artists you've never heard of are making a living off their music in the next couple of years. 100,000 artists you've never heard of are going to make a living off their their streaming news, the revenues. You know, where are those artists? Are, you know, how, how how can they be how can artists become those artists? Yeah. making a living off their streaming revenues. And right now, I, I see very few of the artists we've worked with being able to make a living off their revenues. Yeah, and but, you know, they never really did. Um, a lot of the artists, you know, I worked for Universal for almost 20 years. I've seen a lot of artists that never were recouped. It's, we, we always come back to this. First of all, you know, a stream is not worth a download, right? A download is not worth a CD, it's just not. They're different experiences. Uh, right. The live experience is a different thing. And Michael and I talk about this all the time. You know, the money you make from your streaming, I, you know, when you hear these people say, oh, well, it's a ripoff and they're screwing the artist. Well, you know, what does your deal say? What percentage do you get by going through your label? Do you, is it a controlled composition? Did you write it? You know, as you kind of go down and things are split up, I know people who are making really good revenue on streaming, but all of them, this is not the end-all, be-all. It's one part of a marketing plan. Are you doing sync licensing, right? Nice. Are you touring? You know, nice. Are you selling merch? There's so many areas now, uh, and you brought this up at the beginning of the, the talk, is that you know, that's a lot for an artist to have to manage their socials with YouTube and you know, the DSPs and their touring and writing and recording. And there's so much more that artists need to do these days but i guess the point i'm trying to make is that streaming is important but it's not as important as i think a lot of people make it out to be um there's a lot more to creating um engagement uh growing your audience that yeah it's nice to have streams but for example um we have a, a client that jumped out and got millions of streams from a release uh, that she did, but she's not doing well on touring. And uh, you know, we had an A and R guy on the show a while back, and he we asked him, you know, how do you sign artists? And he said, I look for that lineup around the block, you know, where people want to go see them play, right? Okay. That's the same way they did it when Elvis was playing, right? Okay. You can you can kind of see that that and feel that energy. Well, these playlists are great. And you can generate revenue from them, but eventually you're going to be taken off of those. It is a meritocracy. It is based on the quality of the track, but it's also based on timing. Um, it's based on a lot of different factors. How do you manage when you're talking to your clients? They, they come to you and they say, well, you know, I, I just got to be on this this playlist. That's that's all I need, and, and I'm I'm good to go. <laughs> I say, okay, then we're probably not the company for you because that's not anything we could ever promise or say to anybody. Our job, again, is to, um, as you just stated so eloquently, get them in place, get them in position so that the, help them understand what they can do themselves to get in position. Um, all the best practices we see, understand what the upcoming uh, voice activations are going to do to the industry and and you know i don't know that playlisting is the end all i agree just you know we had okay so we had uh, lp we had L lps 33 rpm lps and then we had eight right. tracks and then we had cassettes and then we had cds yeah um, and we had mixtapes and now we have streaming and um, I, I heard this amazing um, interview this morning, Joe Smith, may he rest in peace, interviewing Ahmet Erdogan about mm -hmm. the beginning of the industry in the 1950s and how Elvis Presley came about. Why? Because of the radio that was going on in that time, which drove people to uh, from his recordings to his live shows, right? Right. So, I don't know it was his live shows drove them to the recordings. In that case, it was the recordings driving to the live shows. And I see it both ways, and I would hope that there's something happening here. That's cool. yeah. I don't know what it is yet I, 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 I think there definitely is something happening, but getting back to what we first started with, 
artists, managers, everybody needs to educate themselves on this. Yeah. And, 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 and part of that is going back and looking at history, meaning, okay, well, look at how radio evolved. Right. How did a radio station and radio playlists evolve? And, you know, read up and study about how payola exploded and how that was was squashed and how that, you know, kind of right. ruined everything and f falsified what you were really hearing. Um, you know, look at how retail sales before SoundScan were were dealt with. You know, it was like, oh, yeah, sure, you're my number one this week. I, of course, right. I haven't sold anything, but you're my buddy. Um, That's you know, right. and then of course you've got MTV coming into the picture, and right. you know the classic song "Video Killed the Radio Star." Right. So what did MTV yeah, do right. to radio? And of course, looking back now, where is MTV and video airplay? It's not right. what it was in the '80s when it was everything. So right. streaming is going to evolve. It will. How yeah. we don't know. And right. anybody who says they know is lying to you? Well, we see hints at it, Michael, and, and I know you and I talk about this a lot, and Andrea uh, mentioned it just a second ago, you know, with voice, you know, with all these, uh, I can't say them because they're all sitting here on my desk, but, <laughs> you know, with, with all these voice-operated uh, smart speakers, you know, then it becomes, you know, play chill music or play the, my, you know, the best music from the year I graduated. It becomes more about mood and lifestyle and less, less about genre. And of course, it's moving into the car now. And, you know, but that's not, that's just that evolution that Michael's referring to. You know, for a while, ringtones were a big, big God, deal. Remember, we, we all remember when ringtones right. were going to be right. the big factor in the music industry. And right. they were for a hot minute. Yeah, you know? for, for one um, minute. For one minute and I they think, were. You know, I think we thought downloads would be around forever, too. And, you know, right. it's it's crazy, this evolution. And the fact that the three of us in our lifetime have seen such an amazing, incredible journey and evolution on these, on music, it's just astounding. And do we know what's coming up next? No, we don't. I, I think smart speakers are maybe the next logical step. Um, I think AI has something to do with some of these things, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, you know, if, if I knew all this stuff, um, I'd be a billionaire, right? So, um, it's going to be interesting to to definitely see how this evolves. Um, Andrea, before we wrap up, um, I want to I want to talk to you just for a second about like what kind of clients um, are you are you working with? Um, are they artists are they labels um are what, what kind of clients are are you are you looking for or are you working with and feel like you're most equipped to help yeah yeah, yeah. so a couple things about that so the an artist who really is just beginning just starting out releasing their first track doesn't have a label or any kind of support those artists usually cannot commit the resources to doing what it takes to sustain an effort. It can happen, but really, I think our sweet spot is artists that already have something happening, but they need to be more in the space. They, the education, as you've both been saying, Mike, you especially, they need to be in the space. They need to understand what it is. So um, we work with um, do-it-yourself artists who do that, although I think that's a really tough road because, as you pointed out, they're writing, composing, and then they're doing their advertising yeah. and marketing. And, that's a and lot. It's a lot. Um, so artists that have teams, labels, managers, management teams, management companies, we work with a lot of artists on, on labels and management company and with management companies. Yeah. And an artist who um, already has social media just really strongly flaring, you know, just they're very strong and they've, they've got a, a, a solid base and they're touring. And those artists can do really well because they've, again, it's not just playlisting. Yeah, we, yeah. The, the, the toughest thing we do is when an artist comes to us and there's nothing going on. Yeah, and that's a challenge. Everything. That's really a challenge. Yeah. So the more an artist has going on, the better. So I'd say it's sort of that mid-level artist who's got something going on, but they really need some help understanding what they should be doing. Right. So where do, where can people find you? If someone wants to reach out and see if it's a good fit, how, how do they find you? Yeah, so they can email me at Andrea at DPG Digital Promotions Group, dpgworldwide.com. You can go to our, our website, DPG Worldwide. You can find us on socials. It's all under DPG Worldwide. So thanks for Excellent. the opportunity to say that. Excellent. <laughs>
I could talk awesome. with you guys all day. Oh, oh, we, look, so, so, we'll, so, we'll definitely know. have you on again. Sorry, Michael. We'll definitely have you on again and continue. And there's so many different areas that we could talk about. Um, but I well, think this is kind of a, a new type of company. Um, what you're doing, yeah. you know, is I think there's going to be a lot more companies like that in the future because that's where the business is and uh, that's where the music industry is going. Love talking to you guys today. Thank you Thanks. so much for joining us. Thanks. Okay. All right. Take care, guys. Take care. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Such a fun conversation, as we said. Uh, it's always fun to talk. For me, I, you know, I've always loved, there's a quote out there called, the only thing that's permanent is change. And yeah. I love change. I, you know, I it, it can be very scary, of course. You can be unsure. But if you don't don't let it deter you, um, it's exciting to see what is that new feature. Oh, my God. They just really, you know, I, we, we, we've said this so many times, especially about Spotify. Is like, you know, they surprise us when they release some of these personalized algorithm-driven playlists. You know, when Discover Weekly was first released when release radar was first released those were exciting changes and yeah i don't know if you saw it today but they you know they've released everybody's year-end 2019 playlist i yep. can't tell you how much i look forward to getting that email I so i can go in yeah. there and see how much i've done is is it kind of meaningless yeah it is kind of but it but it's fun it's, it's as, engaging as, it's yeah it's it engages fun. you so, yeah, it makes me want to come back to the platform. I know that Apple's having their version this year. And, and as you know, I every week I, I put together a curated newsletter called Your Morning Coffee. So every week I'm scanning all of these stories, reading a lot of stories about what's going on in the industry. And what you said is spot on. There's so much change. And it's in little increments kind of every week. There's a little twist here. There's a little update here. And then by the time you look back at the year, you're like, oh my gosh, the the progress that's being made across the board, whether it's with smart speakers or with sound in general, with the, you know, the Dolby Atmos or whether it's with the digital service providers. And there's all of these great things that are happening and one thing that you and I talk about a lot and will be coming up on a show soon is all the different tools that are available for folks to use to market their music. That's what's really exciting to me is, you know, sometimes you'll call me and go, hey, did you try a bot letter? Have you tried such and such? And learning these new platforms and new tools and, and incorporating them into your marketing that's the exciting part for me. Yeah, it, 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 it definitely is for me as well. I mean, you just never know where that, you know, the one out of a hundred items comes across your desk and it connects and it works right. and people and love it, using it for years. and everybody's using it. I, you know, yeah. that that's exciting. And I think the streaming world is filled with that. You yeah. know, the... I, I, you know, I'm still super excited about Station Head. You know, the fact mm -hmm. that Station yeah, yeah. Head is a ra not Michelle. only is it a radio station, but every play that somebody listens to that track is a is a credited stream back to Spotify they get paid or on. Apple. They get yeah. paid on that, so you're mm -hmm. actually helping the artists by listening there. That's right. Um, and it's your radio station. If you want to do, you know, Rock is Not Dead or Here's the Best Power Pop or Here's a Kiss Thing, you can do whatever you want. You control it. But to your point, it's not, you know, something where no one's getting any benefit from it. There's a direct benefit every single stream. It's just another stream that they get paid on because it's drawing from yep, Apple Music yep. and Spotify. So, so y you know, if, cool. if, if nothing else, what I, I would always encourage everybody, if you are in the music business on the, on the management, marketing, promotion side, or you're a band, regardless of what you think about Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, what, you know, whether you love them or hate them, you have to be on top of what's going on. You have to be using them so you understand it because let's let's face it, streaming isn't going to go away. We're 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 not going to go back to the good old days of selling vinyl and making a fortune off of. That's not happening. So accept it, learn what you can from it and stay on top of it. Yeah. 
Absolutely. All right. So um, once again, lots of love to all of our sponsors, Bands in Town, HypeBot. Um, Thanks, Bruce. Yep. Thank you for everything you guys do. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit that little red U, that YouTube subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you can head over to iTunes, leave us a review and a rating. It means a lot. It helps us appreciate as it. well. It's very well appreciated. That's it. We're out of here. We'll see you next week.